Needless to say, I'm not standing behind the podium for obvious reasons. I'll go ahead and get this out of the way. Uche, what the hell? <laughs> How am I supposed to follow that? I feel so inadequate. You took like, I can't program, but I can give presentations, and now I can't even have that? Thanks a lot, man. Uh, no, brilliant job. At least I got to sit on the front row while Genius rode into town. Um, I also want to jump into, um, um, I want to go ahead and give a little bit of a shout out. You've got to be crazy to organize a conference. Starting a conference, whole new level of insanity. So Scott, Frank, the entire Pi Colorado team, you've created something wonderful and different and distinct. Kudos to you. Kudos to all of you for coming. Bring someone next year. Also, I want to give a shout out to our hostess, Jim Fulton, who's going to be a part of my presentation. Uh, Jim's my oldest friend in Python as well as my colleague, and I'll, I'll try and sum it up this way. Most of us would be very lucky to have and deliver one killer idea in our career. It would take two hands to count the things that Jim has done, and you'd still forget, which I, in doing some review this morning, was like, oh, restructure text, structure text. Jim announced that in 1996. Uh, fabulous things that he's done under the, over the years. Thank you for everything. I was joking with uh, this gaggle, who's going to have a good question for me later, that I used to do my warm-up joke was, what were you doing in 1994? When the majority answer became waiting to be conceived, I dropped that joke. I mean, it's funny in a nursing home kind of way. <laughs> but I get enough of that anyway. So instead, let's go back to the topic of this talk. It's no uh, November 1994. There's a Clinton in the White House. This slide was a lot funnier three years ago. <laughs> Number one movie in November 1994. <laughs> I enjoy listening to the laughs kind of catch up a little. Bit. You could order books without leaving the house. Just to explain, books are these things that you go to bookstores and they've got them on shelves. You could order books. You would go over to Windows 3.1 and you would open AOL or NCSA Mosaic. You'd open NCSA Mosaic. <laughs> Several minutes later, you would order a book and it would show up at your house. Isn't this so cool? Look at this pre-HTML2. Oh, isn't that just gorgeous? Uh, this one. What a catchy little title. <laughs> Weren't they so cute back then? And just the layout of it, like, get your tables off my lawn. Pre-tables. But what else happened in 1994? The Python community started, and that's the topic of this talk. What happened then? Why do we say it happened then? And what I'll try and do is frame this a little bit in the what happened just before what happened then and then up to 2000 in that little time period. I intend this to be a conversation. I have a job to do. It isn't to inform you, it's to entertain you. I will say some things that are true by accident. If you let me know, I'll remove them. But it's also your job to ask questions, say funny stories, and entertain me. Don't wait, just stick your hand up if you've got something funny to say. If it's true, even better. A little bit about me, I've done some things over the years. The thing relevant to this talk is in 1993, I did a web server for the Navy. Like everything else in this stupid talk, it's a funny story. Um, to include, this is the first existence of Pauly on the interwebs. Hey, I'm having trouble compiling this. 
Mark Andreessen, <laughs> undergraduate programmer at NCSA in Illinois or whatever, answers my question, my tech support question. Our lives went in different paths after this. <laughs> but that was kind of cute. Um, and uh, also my Python story a little bit from that same time period was, it's mentioned a little bit in there, was um, I needed a uh, scripting language, I had kind of an extension system. This was pre-CGI. And back then you had choices. Some people were doing things in C, and eh, not likely. Some thing, people were doing things in Bash. Nah, not going to do that in Bash. And then people were doing things in Perl. It's like, okay, that sounds all right. So I go to the, the bookstore, that thing with books, and I go to the computer section, and I get the Perl book out. I've got a vivid memory of this. This one is true. I pull the Perl book out, and I'm like, oh, hell no. And there's this thing online, it's a Python tutorial, it's Postscript, pre-PDF, and you could print it, you can read it, and I did. And it's like genetically engineered for my brain, I could understand this thing. And that was my Python origin story. If you have time afterwards, come and hear the funny story of what happened just after that. So pre-1994, that's kind of my Python origin story. What's going on at the time? What was, how did we get there for Guido? Uh, there's a really good article that's come out now uh, at ZDNet. I think it came out like two or three weeks ago. This guy did his homework. Um, there's, there's some good background in there about what was Guido's background. I won't go into it too much, but he was on a programming language project called ABC at uh, CWI, a research institute in the Netherlands. It didn't work, but he learned a lot. And the team disbanded, and he was over Christmas or something, and he said, I'm going to write a programming language that learns from those lessons, and I'm just going to give it away. And as Guido pointed out when we did the keynote panel, I believe, he said the reason Python was successful was because the internet existed. If this would have been two years earlier when ABC failed, Python would have failed because no one would have noticed. There was actually some way to give it away for free and for people to, um, for him to reach people. Uh, so that's a little bit about Guido's story. And the milieu, you like that fancy word? The milieu at the time was there were these languages that were higher level than some of the systems programming languages, and they were labeled scripting languages where the grown-ups would say, you and your scripting language, how cute. We'll bring the grown-ups back later, and we'll re-implement it in C or something like that. And so there was this pile of scripting languages at the time that were kind of competing with each other. Uh, Perl was bigger than bigger than big. Everyone was doing Perl. Tickle TK, uh, audience participation, raise your hand if you know what TCL stands for, and your name's not Jim Fulton, <laughs> or Jim Baker, or Moshe. Anyone? Yes. You are the first person to ever get the T right. Yay for you. <laughs> Did I tell you I got some funny stories? So there's a funny story about this. So this is the first Python book. Guido was a co-author of it. Aaron Waters, I think, really was the primary author of it. And they wrote the book, and they're like, hey, we need cover work. And uh, Jim and I had our company in Fredericksburg, Virginia at that time, and we paid a graphics artist named Nancy. Well, yeah, we'll do it. And so Nancy comes to Paul, and, I, and she says, what do I put on the cover? And I'm like, Ugh. a snake, glasses, can of spam. And there <laughs> gets you the ugliest book cover <laughs> in computer literature history. Not her fault, not Guido's fault. Probably my fault. <laughs> um, Guido at that uh, keynote panel at PyCon a number of years ago brought this up. Python had, around that time, a mailing list. And by mailing list, what he means is an Etsy aliases file or something that he edited by hand. And as the Python community grew, 
That job became a little bit more cumbersome, and Guido knew that he had succeeded when he could hand that job over to somebody else. Uh, but that was how we organized ourselves. We also had, I'll compress some time, maybe you give me the correction on this. There was some year where a gateway to this magical thing called Usenet News NNTP arrived, and there was a news group, comp.lang.python. And as Barry and Guido point out, there's comp in, in the name, right? There's comp, there's lang. Oh, it's a Monty Python fan group. And so half of the messages in the early days were people coming in wanting to talk about cheese shop skits. <laughs> you can never, ever be smart enough to be idiot proof. The number of idiots is always going to be plus one. All right, this is the very first email to the community from Guido. No, not 15 minutes. Not 15 months. We're not even close to that. This is the first email from Guido. I promise. Uh, I gave a version of this. I think I told you. I gave a version of this in St. Petersburg, Russia, that went for two and a half hours. <laughs> I'll come in under that. Um, this is the introductory email from Guido to the mailing list explaining the rules of the road. Pretty cool, normal, blah, blah, blah. This is the very second email. This is so cute. First of all, up here, he has to explain how replies work. Oh, it's so cute. And then this is funny. Someday, I'll <laughs> yeah, that day never came, did it? Now, I do want to go back and do another audience participation thing. This, all right, here's the Wikipedia page. Get your cars ready on this. All right, audience participation, raise your hand if you know what UUCP means. You got up first, go. Yes, good, all right. Next, who knows that? I don't know if I, you knew, the, I think you knew the first one. So, no, 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 you. Yes, plain old telephone service. All right. <laughs> Do you remember when 33.3 was like blisteringly fast? Oh, infinity. This is my very first email to the Python mailing list. Those of you who may know me, this is the funniest, polliest message ever. The very first thing I talk about was my blathering about Python persistence and objects and stuff on the web and things. Then, going into the workshop, before we kind of even convened, this meme started. Raise your hand if you've ever seen this meme reference before. What if Guido got hit by a bus? I want to see if that's still popular. All right, not that many. I thought there would be more than that, especially with what happened recently. Narrator, Guido didn't get hit by a bus. Guido ran over himself, I should say that. And uh, as, as was the, the time, it was all framed in terms of a joke. And then what would happen if Python actually went somewhere and Guido departed, went on to some other thing or whatever, what would happen to the rest of us? A little bit of forethinking, even though there were not that many people involved. What do I mean when I say not that many people involved? We'll get to that in just a second. Just, I, th I thought I would throw this one in for all of you language geeks. From the very damn beginning, Guido expresses his eternal love for lambdas. <laughs> <laughs> I should edit that and change it to be like, oh my God, I sh really should have done first class lambda functions. <laughs> and if I give enough speeches and say that, it will become the truth. Now, here's kind of the crux of it. 1994, November 1994, a workshop was organized which kind of kicks off the birth of the Python community. You may say to me, Paul, you've lied to us so far on everything that's come out of your mouth. Isn't this a lie? And I would say, no, no, actually not. this actually did happen. And you would say, I demand proof. And I say, proof you shall have, stand up. 
This is the T-shirt from that conference. Because Captain Buzzkill won't let me do a two-hour talk. I've got a funny joke about my shirt of that. I'll tell you later. So we announced a workshop at NIST, National Institute of Standards, Gaithersburg, Maryland, boring windowless office building with room for up to 20 people. Who would need that much space? It was infinity. And we put together a uh, agenda in advance. What kinds of things should we talk about at this workshop? Audience participation moment. Read through that list while I'm blathering and see if there's something on that list that still bugs you. All right, keep reading. Keep reading, keep reading. All right, Moshe goes first. What is it, Moshe? Which number? Number three. Thank you. Did you do that for me? Did you do that for me? Oh. Anybody, got, anybody else? Bill, is your hand up for something? No. All right. Anybody got one that bugs them? Yes. Number one. <laughs> he worked hard on that. Anybody else got anything? All right. My only, what, was your hand up? Number six? Oh. We'll get to that. I've got a slide for that. All right, yes. Number eight. Mm, you would say that, wouldn't you? The language professor. This is the only thing I worked on, which was funny because it was a complete, utter, and comical failure. Here we are in November 1994 with all of 20 people, and Michael McLay and I are writing bylaws for a consortium. <clears throat> Pictures to prove it happened. Yeah. Hey, wait, wait. Too much. Too much. <laughs> so this is uh, Guido talking to his future co-workers, Roger Massey, Barry Warsaw. Isn't hey, Guido so cute? Look at him. He's so young. Michael McLay, the unsung hero in the entire history of Python, if not for him, organizing this and some other things that he did later. We might not be talking to each other. This is a picture of Barry Warsaw on the inside. <laughs> My man Jim, and this is me before I got married and learned you could spend more than $5 on a haircut. <laughs> so what was it like? Well, the nice thing is none of you were there, so I can say whatever I want. Um, we had grand strategic visions, which came to fruition exactly as we planned. Um, no, uh, it felt a little bit like something, that there was a there there, but it also felt like just a nice collegial uh, people enjoying a technology, but, I mean, you keep going back and forth on some of these things, but some of the seeds got planted there that grew into the thing that grew into the thing that grew into the thing. Do you have anything that you, th what, that you have as your big takeaway? Persistence. <laughs> Persistence. Of course you would say that. Coming out of that, what did that November 1994, it shouldn't have meant anything, mean? Uh, we'll go through the next couple of years of Python, the Python community, and the larger Royal Python. We had a, can I say shitload? Can I say shitload? We had a shitload of these. People wandering in, couldn't be bothered to go read the previous 500 shitloads. Um, preach you my food for me, uh, answer this question about how do you stack up against these. Do you notice a name that's not up there? Java had not arrived. I'll talk about that in a couple of slides later. So we had a lot of that. Then we had another workshop organized by my man Jim, who organized the third workshop as well. And this time... <laughs> We might hit 20. It was also a, it wasn't a windowless government office building. It had windows, but again, the chairs didn't have padding. Those chairs were, um, But this one 
This is the Menlo Park one, right? This one had an interesting point, which I swear to God, it matches what I'm about to say. <laughs> oh, my God. A guy presenting son's set-top programming language named, named Java. It didn't even have the name Java then. He was talking about it. It also had... That was cool. It also had two guys from the Stanford Digital Library Project talking about their project named... Some of you said it. Yeah, if you don't know what it is, you could Google it. Uh, 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 uh. Yes, uh, Google at that time was written in Python. And there is some dispute amongst us, Barry and Guido and Jim and me, about whether either of those points are actually true. But as the one with the microphone, I declare them true. Did I go one too far? No. All right. Then things start to organize a little more formally. This is the start of the thing before the thing. We know the thing, the Python Software Foundation. There was a thing before that called the PSA, Python Software Activity, which started somewhere in the 1995 time frame, um, organized a little bit under CNRI, a little bit under our company, Digital Creations. Probably the right, wrong solution for the wrong problem. I think that's probably the best way to put it. But a step that needed to be take on, taken on the way to the right step later. A little bit more on Python community and organization. This is not 1995, but it's a way for me to talk about 1995. We'd organized into special interest groups, people interested about certain topics as a way to kind of scale manpower and mental management. And there was a SIG that, was it Andrew Kuzma? Yeah, Andrew Kuchling, the catalog SIG, which was the successor to the very first SIG, the locator SIG, my SIG, it didn't deliver a damn thing, which is unsurprising. We had a third workshop hosted by Jim. This one was a little bit different. The seats had cushions. Uh, in Reston, Virginia, another, was it another USGS office? Another USGS office. This one was bigger. This was organized. It almost had like tracks and things. I remember, no one else does, making everyone else wrong and me right. This was where proof of numeric began. Raise your hand if you ever use numeric. Who changed your hand up? You're like, maybe I did. Yeah, all right. All right, cool. Numeric now being the prehistory of the thing saving Python's bacon. All right, anything else worth up there? Yeah, all right. Oh, yeah, my ill-begotten locator sick. Guido left uh, Europe and got employment at the Corporation for National Resource Initiative, CNRI in Reston, Virginia, a nonprofit doing research in the public interest. Headed by a guy named Bob Kahn. Bob describes himself as the creator of the internet, the founder of the internet. Um, he did a lot of the math and was a project manager for Vint and Surf that created TCP IP. I'll give him some of that credit. Bob's wife, Patrice, was an intellectual property lawyer. Bob's right hand man, Al Veza, ran conferences. We'll return to the theme in a moment. But Guido went there and got a team together, kind of called Python Labs. A lot of the famous people, um, uh, Barry Warsaw, uh, Jeremy Hilton, Fred Drake, Ken Mannheimer, Guido, Roger Massey, and that's it. Is that right? Close enough. Uh, they made a web browser in Python using all the beauty one gets with TK Enter. As part of a project to do mobile code, that was one of the research projects that they were going to do that was going to bring in a lot of funding. They also did it, the handle system, which was a successor to DNS, and a number of other things. So they were there for five years um, doing some core Python, doing some other things that promoted Python, and CNRI was acting as the home for Python community activities and possibly intellectual property. Dun, dun, dun. 
I mentioned Al Vez, the right-hand man. Fortech was a conference organizing company, professional high-end, semi-expensive conferences. Uh, they did the World Wide Web Consortium conferences, which were a thing, not just a thing, they were a huge thousands of people thing. They did the IETF conferences, I think they did some others. And they took away our spam conferences, changed them into the IPCs, International Python conferences, and rates went up and the professionalism went up and it just kind of changed a little bit. How am I doing on time? Perfect. Under an hour, right? Now, um, I will make my own demarcation and say Python is separated, the history of Python is separated into thirds. And I will choose the year 2000 as the pivot point, the ending of the first third and the beginning of the second third. Several things happened in that time frame. Um, as uh, Slashdot points out here, Guido and team left CNRI and went to a dot-com startup in Silicon Valley called Be Open. What could go wrong? This went wrong. It folded eight months later. Um, I will try to not give us too big of a pat on the back, mostly because I can't really reach my back. But we did a solid for the Python community. We employed the five of them for three years. Narrator, they're pretty expensive. And um, if you go to look in the Python license file, you'll see a lot of names in there. One name you won't see is Digital Creations because we wrote into their employment agreement protection against us that any work they did on Python, core Python, the intellectual property would be owned by them, not us. So I'll call this as a little bit of a pivot point in the year 2000, several things coming together. Uh, one of the things, the precipitating events at CNRI, from my perspective at least, uh, Guido has done some interviews with the Computer Museum online. They're really good. He talks about this a little bit. Uh, CNRI's mode was to come up with good stuff and license it. Licensing meaning revenue. To sustain future development. Things were afoot to try and get Python to be successful in that model. I've asked Barry this. One could imagine that the history of Python at CNRI, would it have stayed at CNRI, would be a licensed model. Would we be sitting here right now if that happened? Hell no. Um, so between that and the license issues, like there's, there was a 1.6.0 release and a 1.6.1 release a couple of days later, purely to satisfy a negotiated agreement to stick their name in the license file for the rest of eternity. Fortech in 2000 was busy organizing their last Python conference, which would be a year later. Uh, their model didn't work. It became the work of the community to pick it back up as the Python conference later and make it successful. So the history of the community and its conference was unstable. In addition, to the intellectual property and the core team. So the core team, the manpower, takes off and goes to this thing, which then collapses. And one could have imagined the IP issue, the conference issue, and then the five main developers scattered to the wind, possibly never to do Python again. Nice little inflection point to pick. So with that in mind, the best two words in any presentation. Uh, get, Dustin, you're up. Um, Eva closed with the same thing I'm going to close with, so I took a picture of it and put it in as the slide. And then she's like, wait, so if I get a picture of that and use it in my next presentation, <laughs> and get a picture and you use it in your next presentation, we've achieved inception. Um, I've talked about the first, what I consider the first third of Python, the story of Python uh, in the beginning, the origin of the community, some things that happened, some lessons that could be learned, 
some jokes along the way. And in my opinion, the, the, it all paves the way for the second third of Python. I think the second third of Python is the real Python, the rise of the PSF as an, an entity that can go out and actually accomplish things uh, highly distinct from other programming language environments, the rise of freaking PyCon and all the regional conferences, well-organized, volunteer run, providing uh, income to go out and accomplish strategic objectives. Um, and then the rise of some of the programming systems, Django and Flask, that we use, kind of paving the way to the third third of Python, the bounty that we all are able to avail ourselves of, and then data science, and then uh, we were talking about local meetups. You were mentioning that local meetups, like almost everyone, are new to Python. And so I'll do my in conclusion and do my uh, story of the future like Ava similarly, which is when I gave this talk at EuroPython, clever people noticed three thirds <laughs> implying that we're finished. So I will say, I will, I'll be unmathematical and invent the fourth third. We are about to enter a fourth third where a lot of us are here just to support you. And the new heroes will emerge and the new story will be told. Lucas Longa has a wonderful keynote from Pi Lindenium talking about Python 2020. And don't be bound by what was. All of you in the fourth third, go make it be your own thing. Go make your own Python, be your own Python community, set your own agenda. And that really is the way we should be thinking about this. The next story of Python is going to be fascinating. We will be the ones watching. Sitting in the audience is the next Python badass. Let that badass be you. Thank you. I will not be doing slam poetry. <laughs> I've got questions. I will, don't make me press the slide to the next question. I'll ask the questions if you want. That was almost a question. Dang, damn it. Question. Anybody got a funny story? Okay, yes, Remy. Okay, funny story. All right, excellent. So, hey, this is funny. Um, I get this, I get this uh, Python tutorial. I'm learning it. But I'm about to go on vacation, of all places, France, to meet this uh, woman that I was dating. And I take my laptop, 286 compact laptop, and in her kitchen, I'm reading and going through the Python tutorial. And she married me anyway. <laughs> also sacrificing the right to ever complain, because you are fully aware. Next question. Was Python's culture set um, in 1994? We could say yes, probably not true, but par probably partially true. A number of the other cultures uh, were very unwelcoming. Jim, were you and I talking about Pearl? And you were mentioning that the Pearl community was not exactly a warm and cuddly place. Possibly. Uh, and Python was. And Jim has a good point, made a good point at that keynote panel on the why. And his phrase was, I hope I get this right, uh, Python is warm and human because Guido is warm and human. And I think that's, uh, did I get it right? And I think that's an important part of the story. Things could have gone differently. We remain a great warm community and other places are just toxic. Uh, why did Python succeed while others didn't? I'm gonna open this one up for discussion. Anybody have any opinions? Uche, why us, not them? It's readable. It's readable. All right. Persistence. Yeah. <laughs> Government office buildings. Okay, readability, good. Who's got another one? General purpose, all right. 
Luck. The, also known as the right answer. Yes, Shep. Uh, the C8 guy was huge. Because it wasn't such a thing in the beginning, right? Well, look, it really was. And, and the CPI... CPI but the standardization of it. Well, I mean, the, the, even at the very beginning, the C8 guy was, was pretty excellent. Mm -hmm. And it enabled a lot of things like NumPy and, and inter, interacting, you know, embedding Mosaic in your Python programs and all kinds of cool things because even though it was later improved, it was extremely safe. So Jim's point is the C API was the thing, and maybe that matches up to the scripting language thing that says, sure, you can have a huge surface area under the water that's in C, and then the humans get to engage it at a more humane level. Okay, I'm going to ask, do I have more time? Do I, no, I don't need you anymore. Do I have more time? One? Ish? Okay, one. All right. Um, Yes, you didn't give Earth, Earth Days. Uh, uh, one that came up in St. Petersburg was um, in the third third, what has caused the rise. And I did audience participation on it, and most people got the most obvious answer, data science. I would also say women, uh, also underrepresented groups, that Python, with PyCon and the PSF, had a strategy, executed it, and succeeded to the point that PyCon went from having like 3% speaker participation that were women to 37% or something like that. It didn't happen by accident. Go ahead, Uche. <laughs> and so as the, the guy who's going to be going back to the nursing home, it's shuffleboard time. Uh, it's my job to help make that next four-third happen. And I, last night I went to the speaker dinner and I called my wife and talked to her. The person who drove me, drove us to the speaker dinner last night, I was thinking, yeah, you're going to be the next one. One of you here is going to be the next one. That's it. Thank you. Go Pie Colorado.